All right, welcome back, judges. All right, guys, for our last presentation this afternoon, we have the honor of hearing from a man who is both a level two judge and a competitive player who regularly makes the Pro Tour, Mr. Zach Elsick. <laughs> definitely my first presentation, so bear with me. Uh, you said I can start this by... Yeah, timer is on the clock. I'm pushing it, nothing's but happening. The presentation is about the oh, okay, we're, we're probably good, we'll find out. So this presentation is on how to top eight a GP and do well at a pro tour. Oh. Step one. <laughs> Just, step one. Step one, exactly. Where is the... Step one, this is my label. It's bottom, bottom, bottom left? Thank you. Just kidding, it's judging versus playing. Uh, pretty sure all of you are familiar with judging. I want to give some experience and insight from a competitive player point of view. Um, just the mind of a competitive player, what they think through common things that you'll run into as a judge. Some of you probably have experience with this, especially if you work a lot of events, but I figured this would be something cool given on how many events that I've done. So a little bit about myself. Spoiler <laughs> alert. It skipped the slide. The, the slide about me is supposed to be in between, which is where I talk about uh, how many events that I've been to. But I'm going to do this one first because it's here. The difference between a hardcore Blue Mage Vintage Master, the Spike, and then Josh, a judge. <laughs> but, but Josh Bear, uh, if you haven't seen this play mat, it's great, by the way. I recommend getting one. Um, in, in all serious no, seriousness, though, uh, judges are pretty much there to maintain the order of an event and make sure it goes smoothly. And players pretty much do the exact opposite. They make things as difficult as possible. Um, do you know how I can get the about me slide running? I don't, it had some cool statistics. It's the one where all the images were, were breaking. Apologies. I can just recite it from memory if that makes it better. <laughs> also, I might be talking a little soft. I don't know if you can hear me well in the back. Sweet. Um, sinuses have been awful the last two days. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, you don't You're right. <laughs> I I guess I don't. It's just a PNG. We can just delete the pictures and then show the slide. Sweet. Why is it all blurry? Ah, there we go. And look, the pictures work. All right. So a little bit about myself. Um. I have been playing casually for quite a while, thanks to high school. Been playing competitively since 2011 or so when Innistrad uh, first came out. Um, I've played in quite a few Grand Prix. Uh, most of my Grand Prix and Pro Tours have been in the last two years or so. Um, that's where I've gotten a lot of experience, hands-on, um, more so receiving from judges than actually judging events. Um, I've had some success. I've also created this monster that a lot of you are familiar with that has made a lot of players salty, so apologies about that. Um, the uh, judging history, I first became a judge in 2011, but I've had a break uh, in between, so I've been judging, I guess, a little bit for the last three years or so. Um, haven't judged that many big events, but I've had, had judged a few, so I'm familiar with PPTQs and the old school PPTQs back in the day. I distinctly remember having to deck check a birthing pod list. That was awful. <laughs> Lots of singletons. Um, and I often find enjoying talking with judges when I go to Grand Prix, especially across the nation and even out of the US. Um, there's a lot to be gained from their experience and knowledge and just seeing how they're doing throughout the day. So onto the slide that we did. Skipping forward, um, just to lay a baseline for the different types of uh, rules enforcement levels, regular, Competitive, professional, um, regular, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. 
very easygoing. Um, don't really do infractions there. You don't need to track anything, which is, I would say, the biggest difference between regular and competitive is you want to track infractions, partly because of cheating and just keeping track of things and informing players that they're doing something that's wrong. Um, competitive, you also get appeals. Um, you have the IPG to guide you. Uh, and then one neat thing is spectators can pause games in progress, which I'm not sure if you've ever had a spectator come up to you saying, hey, I paused this game. Can you come help? Because I saw something break. That's something that happens in competitive. Um, transitioning to professional REL, which are usually the events that are at Pro Tours or day two of a Grand Prix, they do not allow spectators to pause games, which I thought was pretty interesting at first because if you see something wrong, how are you supposed to fix it? And I would like to say the reason for that is because at professional, it's assumed that players know what they're doing and they might be bluffing. So as a spectator, how are you supposed to intervene properly? Um, but you can find a judge and have them come look and review whatever the situation is, tell them what you saw. Um, that's probably the biggest difference that I see at professional events. Um, I have noticed that Pro Tours uh, include, I believe it's only L3, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but usually only L3s go to those. Um, those are a pretty unique event because of the wide range of people that come that speak different languages. And so having multiple judges that speak different languages is important for communication and translations. Um, it's also a really weird environment in the sense that beginning of rounds and during rounds are often pretty quiet in comparison to Grand Prix or an FNM. Probably the concentration level and how much people are focusing on the games. That's something that I always find interesting when playing at those. Talking about Grand Prix versus your local PPTQ. Um, Grand Prix look like a big monster. There are a whole bunch of different roles that you can be involved in. Um, anywhere from head judge, floor judge, scorekeeper pairings, feature match, end of round, deck checks, deck list, side events. There are probably some that I left off of there. Um, typically, as a judge, you would be assigned one or two of these roles um, from what I've seen. And that's the thing you'll be doing the whole day. Day two, you might be doing something completely different like side events or what have you, wherever the resources need to be had. Um, PPTQs, you have a lot less or what seems like a lot less because you just have the TO, head judge, one to two floor judges, and then were, which I put up there because if, if you are the superhero of your PPTQ movie, where is the villain that helped make the movie? I, I, I remember the first time I had to use were, which was only about a year or two ago. I'm like, this software is awful. <laughs> but you have to put up with it to get to what you want. Anyway, exactly. <laughs> or the fact that it needs to run online. There's, it, you talked about that whole presentation. Um, but what did I want? What I wanted to emphasize with this is that Grand Prix seem bigger, but to me, I think there's a lot more responsibility to be had in a PPTQ because everything on the right, you have to do all the stuff on the left. You have to be the floor judge. You have to do the deck checks. And so your roles kind of overlap. And in a way, you can get a lot more experience, um, whereas at a Grand Prix, you can get fine-tuned experience, if you will. Um, so I guess it's important to have a nice blend of both. Uh, talking about players <clears throat> at competitive events, um, there are quite the number of things that players will do to try to disrupt a nice day of playing Magic. Um, anywhere from what I've listed, calling everything a trigger is probably one of my favorite. I'll thought seize you, don't record the life total. Other guy calls a judge, oh, he didn't lose his two life, he missed his trigger. What? Like that's, that's not a trigger. <laughs> or uh, authority of the consoles forces creatures entering tap. They didn't put them in tap, missed the trigger. Anything's a trigger. And the reason why I want to emphasize that, uh, because it can span to who knows what. A lot of hardcore competitive players understand that I can let my opponent miss trigger. And when they let an opponent miss a trigger that's not a trigger, and then they realize, oh, that wasn't a trigger, that could be dangerous grounds for I'm gaining an advantage for something that I should have been keeping track of. Um, that's, I 
don't think I have a good example of that coming up recently, but it is something to be aware of, is that triggers is often misrepresented. Uh, similarly, in response is the thing that I hear most often, and I always get laughed at when I play, or I laugh internally when people use this term for silly things such as, uh, I'll attack with my creatures. In response, I will block. <laughs> like, okay, well, why did you say in response? Or I'm going to cast my cryptic command with three modes doing that. In response, I'll negate. Like I didn't even tap my mana yet, and yet you used in response. Um, players are often very excited to cast their spells, and so sometimes they will forget, which is why in response happens a lot. Uh, okay is probably my least favorite part about playing competitive magic, um, which I, I noted at the bottom that communication is a big deal, and okay is like the easiest way to mess something up communication-wise, because it can mean anything from it resolves to I acknowledge that to okay, it's on the stack to okay, I concede to, you know, whatever. And <laughs> exactly. So uh, this, you'll run into a lot of situations just because when you have people who are used to playing kitchen table magic and they show up to a grand tree to play competitive, they're not used to the correct terminology, if it were. Um, and often there's like this language barrier on I'm used to playing in tournaments and that's what this word means and that's what I expect versus I don't really know what's going on. I just want to cast my spells because my creatures are big, etc. cetera. Um, okay is dangerous. Priority is something that I often see lacking uh, from the knowledge perspective of players just because, again, coming from like a kitchen table environment or even those that play competitive, you don't have to interact with priority that often. You just kind of do things, the game flows, and then you get an outcome. You just attack and damage happens. But the precise exchange of priority as you transition steps or as you cast a spell, it's pretty rare that that'll come up and it can confuse and usually infuriate or anger a few players because they don't expect something like this to be in what they thought was a simpler game. Um, I recently discovered a very weird priority trick uh, with Modern. Modern Storm has started playing Wipe Away, which has split second and it returns a permanent. I like playing Tesserator, which has useful toolbox cards that you can fetch with Word of Invention. So being able to tutor up, say, Tormod's Crypt at instant speed to exile their graveyard, um, if I use that, Word of Invention on my opponent's turn, my opponent being an active player, and I get a Tormod's Crypt, naturally I would just want to crack it and exile their graveyard. However, since the spell has finished resolving, the active player gets priority first. They can choose to bounce my Tormod's Crypt before I even have a chance to activate it. That seems a little weird, and obviously players who aren't familiar with priority, priority might get confused in that regard. Um, the other big thing, and this one is quite big, even though it doesn't look big, is slow play. Um, there is a lot of slow play at competitive events. And it might be because coming from a more casual environment, you're used to thinking longer for turns that seem like they don't matter that much, but you just want to make sure you're doing everything right. Um, that's not good to do that repeatedly for extended periods of time at a competitive environment. You need to play at a reasonable pace and players are very bad at it. I'm bad at it because often I'll get lost in thought thinking about all these possibilities and not realizing the clock's ticking on me. Um, and I think judges also are kind of, have a hard time identifying when a player is slow play and when they aren't. Um, that can be a whole nother presentation, but just wanted to stress these common issues that players run into. <coughs> common judge calls. Um, these are the ones that you have to answer when someone says judge and then they put down your hand and you don't know who asked for a judge. <laughs> <laughs> Which happens a lot. Um, common ones that I hear are, can I get the oracle text for this card? Uh, smart players will ask for oracle text before playing a card that won't interact the way they think they will. Um, does this card target? RTFC. Some of you may be familiar with <laughs> reading the fantastic card 
Um, if more players would read the cards, there would be less issues, just like if more players would communicate. Um, but reading the card is uh, surprisingly an easy way to answer judge calls because some of them are as simple as just picking up whatever card they have a question about and reading it back to them. Um, can I go to the bathroom? This is a curious one because I can't imagine there'd be a situation where you would say no. However, I ran into said situation about two weeks ago. I was up at the RPTQ in Seattle and we were doing, what was it? Registering our sealed pool and a player had finished early uh, and he wanted to go to the bathroom. And someone said, no, you can't go because we're still in this process and we don't want things going on. And then about two minutes later, someone else on the other side said, can I go to the bathroom? And the, the other judge said, yes. And so this guy's like, wait, what? I, I really need to go to the bathroom. Usually, I, I don't know of a really good reason for why you would deny someone uh, going to the bathroom other than you're maybe in the middle of a draft. Um, but did you have something, Katie? Yeah. Right. Uh, the concern there is that at an RPTQ, it's a little bit scary to let players go and mingle or what have you. Um, the other situation I've seen is that like a team event, because if one team member goes and leaves the table, they can't come back and communicate with the other team members. And I saw this, I think, happen on a feature where the player and his opponent both wanted to go to the bathroom. They were like, Judge, can you come with us to the bathroom so that we can still talk to our teammates? <laughs> Which I... I think, I think they allowed that because that was kind of a weird situation, um, but it, I still found that funny because, you know, human body and such. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question away from the table? More experienced players like using this one, even if it's for something simple, because they get to get away from the table and ask you a question without the opponent knowing what it is. Um, that can be as simple as, can I get the oracle text for a card my opponent has? Or... Maybe some other weird interaction that might come up in the next game because they heard about this deck or whatever and they don't want to give the opponent a clue or strategy that they're thinking about, so they want to ask away from the table. Um, I've heard some cases where players will do this if they want a judge to watch for slow play. Instead of just calling a judge and say, hey, can you watch our game for slow play in front of the opponent and you know, giving off that feel, they'll ask away from the table, the judge can come watch. Um, it runs a little bit more smoothly in that regard. And then the last one, how does this card work with that card? Judges aren't really there to help players play the game. They kind of have to figure it out for themselves. Um, and I think I do hear this one somewhat frequently, and it's usually from players who don't play in that many competitive events. Maybe it's their first PPTQ, and they're used to playing you know, with their friends or at FNMs, where a judge is there to help them and instruct them on how the triggers would work or how infect damage will work with these creatures, um, trample and such. And so that's a question that usually you kind of have to deny. Um, but you could also ask other questions to try and figure out their intent or their outcome if they're being specific. Try to see what they want to happen as opposed to possibilities for what they want to happen. Uncommon judge calls. I don't know if you can read the text from that far, but on the right you have Opalescence, which is every Legacy player's favorite card. And the first one is, how does Opalescence work with Humility if both were put into play at the same time off of Warp World? Easy. Uh, card over here, Chains of Mephistopheles, of which you read the card and then you read the Oracle text and then you still don't know what's going on. That's mostly helpful. Um, and then I had two other ones. Let's see. Judge, my opponent has a scalding tar in play, but this card isn't legal and standard. And the judge says, this is a legacy event. <laughs> Don't want to be that guy. And the last one, which I witnessed personally, was I accidentally shuffled my hand into my library after cracking Evolving Wilds. Don't know how that happens, but it does. <laughs> Players are very creative. <laughs> very creative in disrupting the game state. Um, three out of four of these are real, by the way. 
so which one isn't good luck? But you never know what commanders do these days. Um, oh yeah, I have to tell you. It, it, it's the one on top, Warp World, because who plays Warp World, right? <laughs> in, in case you were curious, what does happen? You have to choose which one you want to interplay first, because when things enter simultaneously, you choose the order of the timestamps. Yes, Katie. By different players? Uh, active players are first, non-active players are second. Um, but that aside. Uh, this was more of just a joke to show the extreme of what players can do to make judges' life more exciting. Um, <laughs> yes? Wouldn't that be reversed? Wouldn't active players choose to go first and then non-active players choose to go second? And then For permanence entering play? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I'll leave that up to you. I, I thought it was just different presentation. different presentation. There you go. Whole thing on humi humility, opalescence, go at it. <laughs> uh, now to more of the meat of the presentation. What are a player's expectations of a judge? So when a player goes to an event, what are their expectations? Um, and this one, uh, I have just come up with a few of these myself. I've also asked around other players who are kind of grinders and they just an unbiased opinion of what they think judges should be. So that's kind of where all of this got compiled from. Um, appear professional, dressed decently, so dressed neat. They expect judges to look nice and be there. Um, they are punctual, showing up on time before the event, as opposed to as the event starts and then fumble trying to get the event to run in the next 15 minutes. They expect punctual judges. Um, answer judge calls quickly. Uh, this one can be a little bit difficult depending on how cooperative the player is with keeping their hand raised or calling for a judge as if they were whispering in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's hard to find them. Um, and to tie into that, uh, judges having an extensive rules knowledge of magic, which I know some judges have more knowledge on card interactions than others, but just as an expectation, players expect to receive accurate rulings for the questions that they have. Um, judges are able to handle situations where players get mad. This is an interesting one because at competitive events, you can get all kinds of different players from casuals who just want to play the game to hardcore competitive players who really want to win at any cost. And sometimes there's a conflict or there's too much salt on the table or someone gets angry. Um, as a judge, I'm not saying you necessarily have to do anything to be an expert in calming people down, but simply your presence is usually enough to help lower the atmosphere and give the a victim, if, it, if you will, um, more, they, they feel safer because they have a judge around. Um, and finally, uh, judges spend time looking for cheaters. Players expect to play in a tournament environment that is a fair tournament, not one in which cheaters can get away with things. Um, I think this topic of cheaters is something that, again, could be a whole nother presentation on how judges can better look for and identify cheaters. Um, but it is something that I think is important for magic tournaments, especially as you go up from competitive to professional REL. So the amount of time a judge spends investigating might vary. Players expect that they spend time investigating for cheaters and such. Tips for stress-free judging. Um, confidence is a pretty big one. If you answer a judge call and you say, I think it's this, or I'm not entirely sure, or I think I remember it this way, and you're not too confident in your ruling, a player doesn't really hold your ruling in that high regard of, I'm not entirely sure if it's accurate because he doesn't sound like he knows what he's talking about. Um, to combat that, you can merely just be more confident and not use words like I think or I'm not sure and just kind of express, this is my ruling and how it is. And if they feel like you know what you're talking about, then they'll feel more likely to believe what you're talking about. 
um, kind of the fake it until you make it. I'm not saying go around and share incorrect rulings, but more that players kind of expect that this authority figure knows what they're talking about. Um, if you're not sure, you can use other resources, which is the third bullet point. Um, ask other judges. Check your phone. Um, there are people are there who have experience that can help you if you don't have as much, and you can just learn a lot, especially when you get those hard questions or the really weird ones or ones you just want to double check on, you're 99% sure. It's okay to double check, especially when a player sees, hey, this judge is taking the time to double check. I feel confident in his ruling because he took the extra effort to learn about it. Um, I can't remember where I heard this. It was pretty recent, but uh, a story of, hey, judge, I think my opponent's playing with a fake card. And so judge comes over and is like, give me a few minutes. And he goes and he checks with the vendor to see if the card's fake or not. Using all of your resources available, that could be a good option. Um, asking questions in odd situations and investigating. Uh, this is something that I think judges could do more often um, from a player perspective. Because it's pretty easy to simply just answer the call and give whatever they were expecting from you without any additional effort. However, spending the extra minute to ask questions when something feels a little odd, like I wasn't expecting those triggers to line up that way, or it was weird that the player responded to that when he could have done it like this, and asking additional questions can help give you a better understanding of a player's intent, what they meant, and maybe you might uncover something like they were actually trying to gain an advantage when they shouldn't have been. Um, this can go a long way for upholding the integrity of the tournament, catching cheaters, etc. cetera. Um, I am all for ask, asking more questions. And then judges are human too. Mistakes happen. Um, judges make far less mistakes than players, in my opinion. But uh, I wouldn't say that it's the end of the world if you get something wrong. Um, I've seen higher level judges make incorrect calls. I've seen lower level judges make incorrect calls. I've seen plenty of players evaluate the game incorrectly and not call for a judge. People make mistakes, but you can learn from them and you can move on and you can apologize to players if necessary. But I wouldn't say let it, don't, don't let it beat you down for the entirety of the day if you make some mistake. Now I have some stories. Gear per Aether Grid. Uh, you probably can't read the text from over there, but it reads, tap two untapped artifacts you control, and then the effect is to deal one damage to target creature or player. This came up at Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. Um, I was there with a few local people and one of my friends. Uh, my friend, I had finished my match already. My friend was playing Affinity, lots of artifacts. This was post-board, so he had gear per Aether Grid in play. Um, the game was pretty close. I don't remember exactly the situation because this was a while ago, but I would want to say the opponent was on some Jund variant at one life. And my friend had drawn his card for the turn, which was Memnite, a creature artifact. He puts Memnite into play. He immediately taps it in another artifact to activate the Aether Grid to kill the opponent. The opponent goes, no, you can't do that. It's summoning sick. And he's like, oh, you're right. Sorry. Uh, pass. <laughs> so as a spectator, I'm like, that's not how that should have worked out. And of course, my other friend who was watching is like, oh, that's not how that should have worked out. And um, at Pro Tours, spectators, usually it's sectioned off. So like you're pretty far away from the event in progress uh, to where they couldn't see your reactions or whatever. But as a reminder, you can't pause matches at professional RAL. Um, so he runs off to go get a judge and inform him of what happened, and it took like three minutes to get one, but eventually it didn't matter because the friend ended up winning with the Aether Grid, but it was still a curious story of how players can go about tricking players. Whether he meant to or not, um, that would be something worth investigating, I suppose, asking the player who said, no, you can't do that, why he thought he couldn't do that. Um, but these weird situations do come up, and it's quite 
uh, difficult as a spectator to witness them and not be able to do much about it, <laughs> aside from fetching another judge. Um, Sanctum Prelate, which I learned is pronounced prelate, not prelate, which feels odd now saying that. Um, this is a card common in legacy death and taxes. And this story involves playing against a burn opponent who plays Riftbolt. Riftbolt is a three mana card with suspend for one. So most burn players just put it on suspend, it comes back, and then you cast it. While the death and taxes player sees the card is suspended, cast Sanctum Prelate, choosing three, which prevents, you know, Riftbolt from being cast. They pass the turn or get around or whatever. They call a judge because they're not entirely sure what's happening because you have this card in exile that needs to be cast. You can't cast cards, non-creature cards, CMC3. Uh, the judge rules, uh, you're right, it shouldn't be cast, so you'll put it into your graveyard. And that was that. That's what the players went with. Um, and then the judge decided to double check the ruling a few seconds after. Uh, well, let me correctly say that. So he, he made that ruling. The players were like, okay. They put it in the graveyard, they continued playing, and then the judge thought, okay, I'm gonna double check that. And so he went off to go double check with one of his team members. The problem with this story is he didn't tell the players, hold on, stop playing while I double check because I'm not sure, or let me give the ruling and then say, let me double check, or before giving the ruling, let me double check and pause. So the players kept on playing. And by the time the judge got back to the table, one, you can't back it up, and two, there were seven cards in the graveyard thanks to this Rift Bolt, and there was a card with Threshold that mattered, Barbarian Ring, that was being used to finish the game off. Um, yes? Right, so the card that's suspended is in exile. When the trigger removes the counter and says, I would like to cast this card from exile, Sanctum Prelate, says you cannot cast that card, the correct ruling is it would just remain in exile with no time counters on it. So that's where the problem was. Um, and this kind of goes to show that if you want to double check or if you expect maybe the players might decide to play on, you could have them pause or if you really need to, maybe because it's kind of a communication issue or you're worried that the players might do something, call over a second judge and have them watch the table as you get someone. That way something doesn't happen that you can't rewind and back up because it's, you know, too late. Um, goblin Guide. There's a lot of things that could be related to Goblin Guide. <laughs> However, um, this is something that happened to me last weekend at Grand Prix Seattle. I was playing in the Legacy event. And I say happens to me, but it, it did not. I was, it was indirect. Um, the players to the table on my left one of them played Underground Sea, pass. The other player very quickly put a mountain in the play, attacked with Goblin Guide. The opponent's like, okay, trigger, flips over a trap, puts the trap in his hand. Guy casts Fatal Push, kills the Goblin Guide. And then a little bit of thinking, and then the turn passes. And so I had watched this, because I'm waiting for my opponent to finish mulliganing, and I say to the Goblin Guide player, hey, did you, did you draw for your turn? And he just says, yes. I say, oh, okay. And I think a little bit more, and I'm like, he had five cards in his hand, a goblin guide, and a mountain. That's still seven. And so I asked him, did you mulligan? He said, no. And his opponent, at this point in time, catches on and thinks, oh, yeah, that is weird. Uh, but he doesn't say anything out loud. He's just silent. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what the opponent was doing, the guy with the underground sea and the fatal push, but the goblin guy player was obviously too excited to cast his goblin guide and get in for two, because that's a pretty good start. And so I quickly tell them, just, just call for a judge. They'll fix it, they'll handle everything. So they call for a judge. No judges come for 30 seconds. I guess they're busy because it's the beginning of the round. Um, eventually, a judge comes by, tell them what happens. The judge says, well, that's obviously not a missed trigger or whatever. You just didn't draw for your turn. You need the draw for your turn. Um, we're going to give you a GRV game rules violation because you broke something with the game. Um, and then that was that, which I thought the opponent should also get a failure to maintain because he let something wrong happen to the game, um, which was my fault for not speaking up at that point in time. Um, however, that's kind of 
the end of the story there. But the takeaway is what was odd that happened with the player with the underground C is for me, from my perspective of a competitive player, I think that's very odd to just pass the turn and not realize my opponent didn't draw the card. Normally players are pretty keen on, okay, I drew my card for the turn, or I did a thing, and they're very aware of that. And so for that to pass by so quickly, especially when your turn you had nothing going on, I thought it was odd. That's a good example of where I would like to spend the extra minute as a judge asking the player who killed the Galvin Guide, what was your thought process going into that? Or like, did you see your opponent miss the card draw? Or what did you think was happening over there? And maybe, maybe they have an excuse or reason why because they were looking at cards in their hand. That's fine, because then you know why they missed it. Or maybe there was some other reason. They said, well, I saw that he missed it, and I'm not responsible for my opponent's missed triggers. <laughs> Who knows? But you can spend the extra minute learning about a player's intent and what went wrong or what happened to, I suppose, understand odd situations more often. Questions? Going yes. Back to the Aether Grid, would you say that a valid line of play would be to say, wait, I have summoning pictures, right? And letting the opponent draw the conclusion from there? I suppose. I'm not very good at trying to be scummy in that regards of get something to go through. But I'm not really sure. Uh, I might also be reciting the story as it unfolded incorrectly because this was two years ago. Um, but it was, it was still curious nonetheless that one player clearly had lethal and the opponent persuaded him that he did not and got away with it, which in a way is kind of impressive. Uh, Katie. Do you think um, players have certain expectations based on Mariel's intent? Like, of course, certain things are expected. Or, you know, if it's competitive or higher, we can actually see it. But, like, other than that? Um, I would say most certainly. Um, competitive players, there's a pretty big mix of people who are kind of new to con the competitive scene and grinders, people who have been playing for a while, um, which leads to some interesting conflicts. Whereas, if you move up to, say, professional RAL, the majority of players are people who are well experienced, who understand the game very well, and they understand what the judges are there for. Like, they know that if they call a judge under these circumstances, they'll get this sort of penalty or whatever, and they, they know it'll happen, or they expect uh, smooth, quick deck checks, or what have you. I, I think, yes. Jeff. Uh, Zach, I uh, salute you as a high performing player slash judge, a true multi class. Uh, well, your first P was your first PTQ win, uh, Blue Tron uh, in Houston over Mark Hendrickson. Was that your first trip to the Pro Tour? Two out, two out of three of those are off. I was playing in, I think it was in Austin. It was Pats. And I was playing Mono Green Tron with three main deck Mind Slavers against Mark Hendrickson right. in the <laughs> finals. <laughs> You're right about the mind slavers, but I think you got some of the other parts wrong, and I, I have some pretty good evidence. All right. And oh, you, you maybe you you recorded that one, didn't you? Yeah, you wrote about. I remember I, that. I got pictures and stuff too. And how would I? Play? I know the room we were in and all kinds of stuff. But and also, have you won any other prestigious Magic tournaments in Texas? Oh, like the Hunter Burton Memorial. <laughs> uh, when was that? 2015. 2016. Um, that was thanks in part to Kalidus. That card is insane. If, if any of you judges have gotten the pleasure of working with players who have a Kalidus in play, <laughs> whew, uh, I, I just, as a side note, I'm a fan of playing as a competitive player. I love playing with all English cards, no foils. No foils because I don't like mark cards penalties. The chance of a game loss is not worth it to me, and I like just having my cards to play the game. Um, all English because often I play with weird or unusual cards, and my opponents have to read them. So if, <laughs> if I have to call a judge every time I put a card in the play, that gets very tiresome. Um, so with Kalidus, it's funny because I always played with English ones, and my opponents still didn't know what it did. <laughs> and they still made mistakes, and I got many, many game wins from that and success from that tournament. 
thanks to Kalidas and Dig Through Time and Jace Friends Prodigy. But <laughs> so how do you get a step from basic player to FM? Because you want to really encourage them to go to these DC events. It is intimidating. Yes. Um, so the question was, how do you get from a basic player to a competitive player? Because larger events can be quite intimidating. Um, I think I'm, I personally am in a rare situation where I don't often get nervous at large events. Um, I used to play competitive Smash Brothers, which relied on very fine movements of the hand. So if you were nervous, you would perform less well. Um, so for whatever reason, I don't get nervous at large events, and I often forget that newer players will get nervous, or they may be intimidated, especially, uh, I hear that sometimes, they say, oh, I have to play against Zach, and then they're worried, <laughs> just right off the bat, and I'm like, what did I do? Um, <laughs> everyone assumes I play that. Uh, however, um, it's, I, I do run into a lot of players that have that, they're, they're worried or they're nervous because it's their first event, but they're there doing it anyway. And I think that's the big takeaway is to just show up and do it. Even if you're nervous, even if you don't day two, maybe you do, um, you still learn a lot because you get to experience the environment and the atmosphere. You get to see how other players play the game when you run into more competitive players. Um, you get to see how helpful judges can be in that type of environment if you're willing to call and ask for a judge. Um, so there's a lot to be learned and gained just by doing it. Um, and I think after a few repetitions, and if you're really set on becoming a better player, you will get better. Have you ever called a judge on yourself? Uh, yes, a few times. I remember doing it in standard because I had fumigated, destroying all creatures, and I forgot that I had pacifism one of my opponent's creatures a while ago. And so about three turns had gone by, and I'm like, hey, this creature should have been dead. I'm going to call a judge because we both missed this. And the judge comes over and rules. I think it was a local judge. Um, and I said, yeah, and I'll get this infraction, and he'll get this infraction because we both missed it. <laughs> uh. Looks like that's it. I ended a little early. Oh, oh one more, one more. As the inventor of Lantern Control, <laughs> what inspired that deck? To clarify, I did not invent it, but that's fine. Um, it was a community project. Uh, some users on the farm came up with the idea. They spent a while working on it. I discovered it many years later, and I watched a video series that was Moto replays and fast forward or sped up. And I just watched the deck win a lot of games. So I'm like, maybe there's something to this, because this weird deck is winning games. So I took the deck, I refined it, played it against the gauntlet, ended up doing well. And I had this weird, surreal sensation of, this deck is good, but no one plays it, and it's on no one's radar. I don't know what this means. I don't know if I should play it. So that's kind of how it came to be. Like, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.